Hi. Oh, hey. There you go. Calling Chris hey. Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson, believe it or not, in London. And calling Rick Byer in? Chicago. Chris, hey. we're back home. We're back know, live. It's, crazy. it's, it's crazy. very exciting. I know. I have to remember how to do this. I know. Welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help uh, uh, of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And whether you're watching live, whether you're watching uh, on replay, or whether you're listening in on the History right, Happy Hour probably. podcast, available pretty much everywhere you get podcasts, uh, we thank you for joining us each week for a cocktail and a chance to talk some history. And today we're going to be talking about the storied 2nd Ranger Battalion in World War II and their last big fight in the Hurtgen Forest. Yes. Um, and Chris, we should say thank you to all of our uh, Patreon supporters, especially Absolutely. our Top Shelf supporters. Thanks, everybody, for supporting us. And you can add yourself to that list at <sighs> patreon.com slash history happy hour. So I would ask you guys who are out there in our audience, tell us what you're drinking today, yeah. right? What's yeah. your cocktail? And Chris, I'll ask you the same question. What have you What have you brought to the table? I've got a nice full-bodied red. Oh, very nice. Oh, yeah. I'm going pale. It's a pale mm -hmm. ale. Good. It's very, very pale. And uh, almost as pale as your forehead. But... Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh, there you go. And um, I would just say, what is um, what? Who's out there? Yeah. Uh, anybody? What? You recognize anybody? Yeah. Well, um, Shutika Garg is joining us from London, and Ken Hartrip from Kansas. Xavier's back, so Xavier's tuning in from, uh, from Barcelona. Barcelona. Uh, Ron Griswold, and uh, who has a Dos Equis Amber, which is always a good thing, and uh, Paula Hammond from Texas. Excellent. So, well, it sounds yeah. like a, a great start, and uh, people say they're excited about the topic, and as are yeah. we. So, Chris, why don't you get us uh, get us going here so I can play the open? All right. Here we go. <laughs> Is open. Bar is open, although I almost hit the end broadcast button instead of hitting the <laughs> bell because I haven't done this in a while. So I know. I that, that callus is worn off your finger. What is on? I hit it with the palm. What's oh, okay. on tap today, Christopher? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, I'm actually, I'm really looking forward to this uh, this this topic and this this show. Uh, we're here to talk about a book called The Last Hill uh, by Bob Drury and Tom Clavin. And um they are authors that you probably have heard of because they've written extensively and amongst the books uh, that they've worked on are the New York Times bestselling authors of The Heart of Everything That Is, Lucky 666, Halsey's Typhoon, Last Man Out, Valley Forge, and The Last Stand of Fox Company, amongst others. Uh, and we're going to be joined uh, this week by uh, Bob. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is, again, the Second Ranger Battalion uh, at a place called Hill 400, which not a lot of people know about. And uh, Bob, welcome. Hey, for Brad, how are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bob, you know, I, 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 but before, Chris, before you oh, jump sorry. into the very important yeah. topic area. History stuff. I, I have been, I've been criticized for, for underplaying our questions about cocktails. So I do have to ask if you brought with you a beverage for the show today. I am uh, from my Ed McMahon Memorial Coffee Cup. I am yeah. drinking a uh, a Sauvignon Blanc from Marlboro, New Zealand. Ooh, very nice. Ooh, oh, wow, he's, he's classing, classing this up a shame. bit. <laughs> uh, I could go get a bourbon if it would make you feel better. No, no, and any any beverage in a pinch. So it's a question of how good it makes you feel. Because oh, it, it, the second good. half of the show always depends on that. Well, I I do zooms, especially with COVID, with the last book, Blood and Treasure. What was it two and a half years ago and everything was zoom so i found that this coffee cup that's why i named it the ed mcmahon your viewers are probably too young to know what i'm talking about with ed uh, McMahon. but he was yeah. the carson sidekick who always had a little uh irish whiskey in his coffee. little something something i think our yeah. average audience age puts us in good shape on that well well thanks so, uh, thanks for having me i appreciate it Fun. Yeah. Well, I was, I said, I was, I was telling Rick, I was really excited about this book because, um, as you know, you and I had spoken, Bob, before the show. Um, it's about the Second Ranger Battalion, and it kind of struck close to home for me because I knew Len Lamel, who you write about quite a bit in the book. Um, and one of the things that, you know, 
when I first met him, like a lot of people, I came to the story of the Second Rangers. Um, I was the editor for World War II magazine, and we were talking about Point to Hawk. And so I called up Lennon Mel one day, and he was very polite, and he answered my questions. And he said, you know something? When I look back at the war, D-Day was not the worst day. And of course, being new to the story, I said, like, what are you talking about? He goes, my worst day was Castle Hill and Hill 400. And yeah, so yeah. I became very intrigued. So I was thrilled to death um, that, you know, you've done this book about this completely forgotten about battle. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. But just to sort of get people up to speed, how did you come to this story? And, and just everybody knows about the Second Rangers, but a little bit of background about the Second Ranger Battalion before we Let's go see. into the woods. As, as, as you both know, especially for a nonfiction writer, you never know when a, uh, uh, a story is going to sneak up on you and a book, a book worthy story is going to sneak up on you and whap you upside the head. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. I was having dinner in Quantico at Marine headquarters. This was years and years ago with a Marine historian who had helped us so much with our book, the last stand of Fox company, our Korean war book. And I was taking him out to dinner to thank him. And towards the end, we were ordering after dinner drinks and coffee. And, and he said, well, so what's the next project for you and your co-author, Tom Clavin? I said, oh, we got a few. We're looking at this. We're looking at that. And he said, did you ever hear of the uh, Sioux warrior chief, Red Cloud? And I probably tell from the look on my face that no, uh, I hadn't. And he said, you ought to look into him. He's the only Native American to ever win a war, not a battle, a war against the United States. I looked into it, and because of this offhand comment, uh, Tom and I wrote The Heart of Everything That Is, spent 25 weeks on the New York Times list because a Marine historian had taken an interest in America's uh, uh, 19th century Indian Wars. So you never know when uh, some, something's going to hit you. In this particular case, this was several years back, two and a half, three we were putting the, I remember we were putting the finishing touches on uh, Blood and Treasure, or Daniel Boone book. And I was out with a friend of mine here. I live on the Jersey Shore. We're having a beer uh, at a beach cafe with a friend of mine who was retired uh, lieutenant colonel, army lieutenant colonel. Uh, and he, uh, ar artillery man. And he said, what's next? And uh, I said, I don't know. We got off the subject. And we were talking about some disaster of the day. I don't know if it was in Iraq, Afghanistan. This was before Ukraine. And he all of a sudden he threw up his hands and he said, ah, reminds me of the debacle in the Hurricane Forest. And I was like, the, the what now? The, the who? The what? The what forest are you talking about? World War II, Hurricane Forest. And by the way, I should, uh, as an aside, he's a crusty old artillery man. He did not use the word debacle. No, I sure probably didn't. I think the phrase he used began with the word cluster. Uh, yeah. Charlie Foxtrot. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I got home that night and I called Tom. I said, I know we have a few things. Maybe we should get, do some cursory research into what this Hurricane Forest, this World War II battle of the Hurricane Forest is all about. I'd never heard of it. And uh, sure enough, we did some research and it was, it was a great it was a wonderful story. I mean, it had everything. It had uh, undying courage from American GIs. It had gore, gore galore. I mean, we were just reviewed somewhere last week, I think in the Times. No, no, it was maybe the Wall Street Journal, where the, we got a good review for the, the last film, but the reviewer did say, this book is not for the uh, faint of heart or the queen. Right, right. There's a lot of gore in this book. And so as we got into it and Further and further into it, I said, I pulled off my uh, uh, official U.S. Army War Department history of the Siegfried Line in uh, 1944, the fall, September, October, November. And I and yes, I am the kind of nerd that does have the official U.S. Army history on my own bookshelf. And I started reading it and I was like, great stuff, but big, but there's no narrative. There's no through line. And, and it's a real meat grinder. I mean, we're talking about body parts strewn across the forest floor, 70 square mile forest, the Hurricane Forest. Uh, the pervasive stench of gas gangrene escaping from thousands of dead and dying Germans and GIs. Uh, you know, GIs fused together by direct artillery hits. And I'm thinking to myself, 
Well, it's no wonder no one ever, I mean, of course, people have written about the Hurtgen farce, but it's no wonder I'd never heard about it before. I mean, we have a tendency to jump from D-Day right to the Battle of the Bulge because of the pursuit warfare. We were just chasing the Germans across Europe. And maybe every once in a while, you'll get a story about the liberation of Paris. And I'm saying to myself and Tom, I'm saying, it's a good story, Tom, but it's depressing. Who's going to want to, we were getting our asses kicked. We had mm-hmm. sent uh, disparate regiments from four United States Army divisions into the Hurricane Forest, into this 70 square mile woodland, straddling the Belgian German frontier. And uh, as the official history was written by the Army's chief historian, Charles McDonald, as he wrote, we would make three feet for every one man down. Think about that. Three feet for every one man down. We had sent 50,000 GIs in there. 15,000, almost a third, had come back either dead or wounded, KIA or WIA or MIA. And uh, I said to Tom, I just don't know. Let me read a little further. And I read a little further, and McDonald had a couple, almost as an aside, a couple of paragraphs about how this battered Ranger battalion, by this point down to 400 officers, non-coms, and enlisted men, as a kind of a last resort, uh, Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower said, let's send those Rangers in there and see if they can help turn the tide. (laughs) Unbelievably, they did. Because at the edge, the eastern edge of the Hurricane Forest, straddling the German-Belgian frontier, was this Hill 400. That's its height in meters, 1,300 feet. And beyond that hill was uh, the German heartland. You crossed the Ruhr, it was a plane to the Rhine. Once you get to the Rhine, you took out the German munitions, you took out their gas. You took. Once you got to the Rhine, the war was essentially over. Eisenhower knew this, and he was hoping to get to the Rhine by the end of the year. That's the whole, me- you've heard, end the war in 44. Yeah. That was his, let's end this war in 44. He was afraid if the Germans had time to regroup through the fall of 1944, that it might extend the war another six to eight months. He had no doubt we were going to win by we, I mean the allies. But he said the concurrent injuries for another six to eight months of fighting, we got to break through somewhere. We're going to break through in the hurricane forest. Hill 400 is the hill we take from there. It's not literally, but it's metaphorically downhill. Problem was the Germans could read a map too. They knew how essential Hill 400 was. Because what no Allied military, mil, military commander knew, and what no uh, S2 uh, intelligence people knew, was that Hitler, of course, had ordered a mass behind the Hurtgen Forest. There was a massive German buildup for a counterattack. Scores of divisions. And, of course, the counterattack became known as the Battle of the Bulge. So the Germans saying, no, we can't. We're surrounded by five Allied armies. We cannot let them breach our frontier or else the Battle of the Bulge is nothing. And so that, to me, made this story a dramatic story, uh, almost a, a reverse Alamo. The Germans defending, the the overwhelming force of Germans defending the Hill 400, and 400, <coughs> excuse me, 400 Rangers take the hill and for a while hold it. So that's what led me into the story. So we want to come back to the the Hurtgen, obviously, because that's really the, the a big focus of your book, and it's also kind of what we want to talk about today. But just to just to follow up on the other half of Chris's question, I mean, for those, I mean, people are probably familiar with the Rangers uh, at Point du Hoc, possibly familiar with the Rangers uh, in the Brittany Peninsula. But but how do why do the Rangers exist? Okay, the U.S. Army is is assembling a, a, a an army of I don't know. 7 million men or 10 million or whatever it is. Uh, they, they already have kind of a, an elite force uh, in, the, in the paratroopers, an elite uh, light fighting force. So, so why did the Rangers even come about? And what is, as Chris said, what is the background kind of on the Rangers taking them up to this, to this battle? One man, uh, U.S. Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall. In April of 1942, He was in London to confer with uh, his British counterparts about a cross-channel invasion. And while he was there, Winston Churchill convinced him to set up 
uh, clandestine units, special forces units, based on Churchill's beloved commandos. Now, this went against pretty much every officer in the United States Army at that time wanted nothing to do with special operators. We were still of the uh, mind of uh, Ulysses S. Grant's Army of the Potomac. Smash through, smash through, smash through. But this idea of small, mobile, in and out units, it appealed to General Marshall's sense of adventure. And he couldn't be talked out of it. So, and he was the boss. So uh, he assigned uh, uh, one of his m most ferocious general officers, Lucian B. Truscott. He said, there's, there's Lucian B. Look, look at him. And he, uh, and he said, I want you to stand up. These uh, Churchill calls them the commandos. Oddly enough, as another aside, it was then Major General Dwight D. Eisenhower, still working at a stateside post in the War Department's planning division, who uh, suggested to Truscott, don't call these uh, Americans commandos. Commandos is a little too British. And he wrote to Truscott, said, why don't we call them rangers? After Robert Rogers and his rangers, who two centuries earlier had proven such wonderful backwoods fighters in the French and Indian War. And so uh, uh, the Marshall liked the audaciousness of the idea. So he set up several ranger battalions. And of course, the first three, the first two and then three, they were they were they entered World War II uh, in North Africa. They were called Darby's Rangers after their commander, William O. Darby. And uh, they did yeoman work behind the lines uh, in North Africa, blowing up the fuel dumps and whatnot of the of the Desert Fox, General Erwin Rommel, uh, in his, the commander of the famed Afrique Corps. And so Marshall saying this works. It could work in France. Now, once again, I, I, I don't know, Rick, I might have to dis disagree with your point about everybody knew about the Rangers of Point Duhok. I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, I, I'm a fairly uh, deep student of American military history, and I wasn't quite sure. I mean, of course, I grew up. I'm of an age where I grew up on uh, uh, movies like Merrill's Marauders. Uh, Jeff Chandler played Frank Merrill. Uh, guerrillas operating in the Burma theater war in the South Pacific. And, and I knew about Darby's Rangers probably from a TV show called the Rat Pack, which I remember watching as a little kid in black and white. And they were a thinly veiled version of Darby's Rangers. But I got to thinking after I read McDonald's a couple of paragraphs, wait a minute, Rangers. Yeah. I knew about the 101st and the 82nd airborne, but Rangers boots on the ground in the European theater of operations. This does not ring a bell with me. And uh, so Tom and I just started following the breadcrumbs. And I think what we do, I am not, I love uh, the big man uh, literature, uh, whether it's Patton or Napoleon or Peter the Great or George Washington. I love reading books like that. But that's not what Tom and I write for the most part. We write about ordinary men who rise to extraordinary circumstances. And these rangers all started out as ordinary men. I mean, bartenders, high school kids straight out, you know, singing in the choir and playing football in high school. And this is what I think appealed to me. And uh, and you mentioned, I'm not sure if it was Chris or Rick who mentioned the longest day. For the, the rest of their lives, these rangers held a grudge against Cornelius Ryan and his book, The Longest Day, and the movie, The Longest Day, because Ryan and the movie portrayed them as having died for nothing climbing those cliffs of Pont du Hoc, when in fact the guns were there, the big 155 howitzers, they were there. They just weren't where they were supposed to be. But the Rangers found them and destroyed them. And uh, Len Lamel, who Chris mentioned before, Len Lamel was the one who found them and incapacitated five of them. Another Ranger outfit incapacitated the six. If these guns had not been incapacitated, if the Rangers had not gone in first on Normandy Beach, these guns had the capacity of driving the Americans back from both Omaha and Utah Beach. And uh, here, here's a little uh, kind of a tidbit. One of the things that got Tom and I interested in this, contemporaneous writing. I said about ordinary men rising to extraordinary circumstances. 
Contemporaneous writing is our meat and potatoes. That's what Tom Clavin and I do. I'm talking about journals and diaries and letters home. And when we started digging into the Ranger uh, Battalion Commander, uh, James Earl Rudder's papers at the University of Texas. And uh, Rudder was, uh, he was one of those, uh, he anchored the Texas, a there he is, he anchored the Texas A&M uh, line. He was the center for the, for the offensive line for Texas A&M. One of the leather helmet, no face mask kind of guys. I mean, just look at that photo of him. You, could, you can kind of tell what kind of guy he was. And in his papers at the University of Texas, uh, of course, we found after action reports, which we use. And uh, it, but uh, Rudder, uh, Big Jim, Big Jim Rudder, as his men began to call him behind his back. We found that he was an inherent letter writer to his wife, Margaret. And uh, Margaret's nickname was Chick. And it was Dear Chick, Dear Chick, Dear Chick. And there was so much personal stuff in these Dear Chick letters. I mean, I feel like calling the book Dear Chick. It wouldn't have worked, but it's a great title for mm -hmm. someone. Uh, and we found out that he wanted to put Len Lamel in for the Medal of Honor for Len Lamel's actions atop the cliffs of Pointe de Hoc at Normandy Beach. And Lamel had talked him out of it. Lamel knew that any recipient of the Medal of Honor, which of course is our military's highest award, is immediately pulled from a combat posting. And we can't, the War Department would not risk a Medal of Honor recipient being killed or worse, captured and paraded about by the enemy. So Lamel convinced Rudder, don't put me in for this, please. I want to fight. I want to stay here. So instead, Lamel received the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest honor. So I'm looking. OK, so Rudder's papers. Lee, who's this guy, Lamel? I look into him. It turns out he grew up and and after the war became an attorney in a community which is maybe four towns away from where I live on the Jersey Shore. So I start looking in the library and it's I find this uh, a retired army colonel, an amateur historian. He has run a posthumous candidate. Len Lamel died at the age of 91 in 2011, I believe. Yeah. But he ran a posthumous uh, candidacy to have Len Lamel awarded the Medal of Honor, not for Pointe de Hoc, <laughs> But for his actions atop Castle Hill, the Hill 400, our last hill, I'm saying, my goodness, there are people who would think who think Len Lamel was Medal of Honor worthy for two separate fights. So I find this colonel, the amateur historian, I ask him, meet me for coffee. He walks into the coffee shop, it's one of those giant briefcases. When he opened it up and pulled out files that thick, I said, oh, we hit the mother load. We got the mother load here. Sure enough. He not only had letters from Lamel's battalion mates uh, attesting to Lamel's heroics, both the top, Pointe de Hoc and Hill 400, but of course in their letters, they describe their own personal uh, reminiscences, uh, whether it was stateside trading when they were stood up in Camp Bedford Forest in Tennessee, whether it was training on the cliffs of Dover in Southwest England for Pointe de Hoc, Pointe de Hoc, the Brittany campaign post invasion, uh, and then of course all the way through France and Belgium into the Hurricane Forest. And I, I called Tom Claver that night. I was I was almost giddy. He said, We get the mother load here. And he said, Yeah, what do you hear what I got? <laughs> Turns out that there was another lieutenant. Actually, Len Lamel was a sergeant. He by the time he hit for Hill four hundred, he had been field promoted to lieutenant. Lieutenant Bob Edlett, the fool lieutenant was his nickname because he volunteered once they, the second battalion got overseas to run so many patrols behind enemy lines. And the fool Lieutenant Bob Edlin had kind of become a surrogate son to James Earl Rudder, Colonel Rudder over the course of the war. And after the war was over, Edlin exhorted, I mean, Rudder exhorted Edlin, put your memories down to paper. People have to remember what you did, what we did. And so Tom, found these two elderly sisters in Minnesota who had taken all Edlin's notes and transcribed them and were willing to send the transcription to us. I'm like, this is great. And he said, that's only part of it. Ike Eichner, who was the, uh, the battalion's comms officer, communications officer, Ike Eichner devoted his post-war life to becoming the unofficial historian of the second battalion. And Ike Eichner was a pack rat. And before he died, 
he donated his papers, six linear boxes, six feet of linear boxes to the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I'm like, I'm with Tom, this is, I'll be down in Carlisle tomorrow. And Tom said, wait, I got something else. The uh, battalion's head surgeon, uh, Dr. Walter E. Block, Doc Block, of course they called him. Tom had found Doc Block's only living son outside of Chicago. And Jeffrey Block, the son, he had his father's combat diary, handwritten. And he said, I'd be willing to Xerox and send it to you guys. So from there, the floodgates just opened. We found uh, memoirs that several of these rangers had written post-war, right after the war, never published or, unpu- or pu- self-published. And I even found uh, a kind of an eyes own diary. It was not a, uh, it was not a unit diary. It was an eyes own that three rangers had kept put together as kind of a book, a pamphlet after the war. It was lewd. It was ribald. It's the type of stuff that the army was not going to put out there, but we found that. And after that, what I'm telling you about here, I may have gone off track. I'm sorry if I have, but this is the contemporaneous writings that Tom and I feel make a narrative. They may not that uh, official after action reports or the gazillions of autobiographies and biographies of World War II or the histories. Not that they don't inform our books or in this case, they don't inform the last hill. But it's these pers- it's this personal stuff that we really feel uh, brings our I mean, our story to life. And these guys were a bunch of literate fellows. And uh, and I thank them all for that. Well, so you know, picking up on that, Bob, one of the things, you know, you obviously really highlight in the book and, and you do such a wonderful job of it. Could you tell people um, a little bit more about these different personalities and, and what sort of people were they? What, what did it take to become a ranger, right? It's not, well, you don't, you don't just show up and say, Hey, I'm a ranger, right? What's involved. Yeah. What sort of people are they attracting to this unit? Well, it continued all through England, but I'll just say when Colonel Rudder was tasked with standing up this outfit in Tennessee, he brought in as many people a day as volunteers as he called. Uh, he he had a an idea of what a ranger should be and should look like. Uh, uh, Truscott had originally uh, his motto was uh, speed, stealth, and violence, and that was Rudder agreed to that. But he also wanted people who could think for themselves, and. Uh, I'll give you an example. There, I, uh, the, the comms officer I mentioned, or did I mention James Eichner, Lieutenant James yeah. Eichner? Mm-hmm. Eichner, they called him. Before Rudder got there, he had served, he had been a nascent ranger, and he had served under a string of kind of ineffective officers. And Ike Eichner took it on himself to do one example. He had been a telephone lineman before the war. And when the rangers were, they were treated like a second class citizens at camp. Uh, Bedford Forest in Tennessee. They were issued field telephones, but only receivers and no wire. So <laughs> Eichner, who had been a telephone lineman, he led a midnight raid to cut down wire, telephone wire around the camp, so the rangers could use their field telephones. Now, there, there was still a two-month investigation. Who did this going on when Rudder arrived? Eichner kind of took the, the, the sense of Rudder. Okay, this is the man. And he said, I better confess. And he went and he said, Colonel, you may have heard they're looking for the man who stole the telephone wire. That would be me. And he explained why. And Rudder gave Eichner a kind of a, a mild dressing down. But that night he wrote to his wife, dear chick, this is the kind of man, individual thinking. This is the kind of guy I want. And not only a man that can that cannot collapse after an 80 mile speed march with full pack, but a man who thinks for himself. Rudder continued that. When they got to England, every morning they're training on the cliffs of Dover. Two or three rangers, sometimes four, would be pulled aside, and they would be given maps. And there would be a city in Scotland, in Wales, or a town, or a hamlet in Scotland, Wales, or England. And he would say, depending how far away it was, he said, you have X amount of time to get there. Grab something that will prove to me you were there and get back here. All the while, he was training these men not to be the most, not only to be the most physically fit outfit in the U.S. Army, 
But in case a private had to take over a platoon, in case the corporal had to take over a company, in case he wanted men who thought for themselves. And I guess to answer your question, I, 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 I would never denigrate any World War II unit of the U.S. Army. But Rudder wanted his men, and so did Darby in North Africa, wanted his men to be a, a step above both mentally, physically, and, and here's something the Army doesn't usually promote, emotionally. He wanted them to be able to handle the trows as well as the highs because he knew there were going to be trials. And there certainly were both at Normandy Beach, both in, in Normandy Beach and Brittany, and certainly in the Hurricane Forest. You know, um, we should, uh, uh, we, we wanna kind of turn our attention to the Hurricane Forest. And, um, you know, you, you have a great quote in the book and you touched on this earlier, uh, for, uh, quote toward the end of the book from uh, Army, Army historian, Charles McDonald, who himself was a company commander during the war, who basically says that uh, most historians or many historians skip over anything that happened from about September 11th to uh, December 15th, the day before the Battle of the Bulge, and give it a paragraph or two. You've got this tremendously violent fight in the Hurkin forest that goes on. So why is there fighting there? What's the point of the fighting there? Uh, uh, and why, what makes it sort of so much, I think it seems almost like more awful than any other fighting, but what makes it so awful? Why is it happening? What makes it so awful? Well, some people would say it was a mistake. Eisenhower, as I mentioned before, wanted to break through. He wanted to break into over the German border and into the heart of Germany before the end of 1944. Now, Patton is the logical man to be the tip of this spear. But Patton is stalled to the south. He's out of gasoline. Uh, Montgomery, uh, the F field marshal Montgomery, the British field marshal, he has he he and Eisenhower did not get along. But Eisenhower was a was a smart thinker, and he would have liked to have given the job to uh, Montgomery because he knew London was being uh, saturated with V V one and V two rockets, and he said this will be an uplift for the Brits. But Montgomery had failed to break through the Siegfried line in uh, the Netherlands. So that left the first army. And the first army, what was between the first army and Germany, the Hurtgen Forest. Now, the commander of the first army was advised by several other commanders, go around it. Go around it. That's Courtney Hodges, right? Yeah, Courtney Hodges. Get over the Ruhr and get to the Rhine. But Hodges was a, stud a stubborn man. And he said, no, I'm going to break through here. I'm going to break through Aachen, the first German city to fall north of the Hurtgen Forest. There it is. Is Aachen on that map? I can't. It is. It's right at the where the red different yeah. parts of the Siegfried Line come together. Yeah. Aachen had already fallen, and people said to him, either the the Monschau corridor south of the Hurtgen Forest or the Aachen corridor north of the Hurtgen Forest. That should be your line of attack. But Hodges, Courtney Hodges, was afraid that he would be flanked by the German troops in the Hurricane Forest. And he said, no, i got to take this forest first. So that was his decision. Uh, to this day, historians argue whether it was uh, wrong, stupid, or imbecilic. Nobody really thinks it was right. But nonetheless, for the 50,000 GIs that were sent in that forest, none of them were wrong, stupid, or imbecilic. They were just doing their job. So that's that's the kind of setup to the Hurtgen Forest. And I think there was a second part to your question, which my uh, Rancott from uh, Marlboro, New Zealand has led me to forget. Uh, well, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'll go let ahead, Chris no. jump in. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just think I think it's important that people know maybe a little bit more about the forest. I mean, the Germans called it uh, the Green Hell. Gruenella. Gruenella. Right. right. And, and Hemingway calls it Passchendaele with tree bursts. Right. What are some what are the what are the what are the surroundings that make this place so unique and so difficult to even walk through, let alone fight through? I think it was continually dark. What it was 100 foot. There you go. 100 foot. Now you see some of them are uh, have been taken out by artillery, but stacked with 100 foot conifers with pines. So even at high noon, it looked uh, a bit like dusk. The forest floor was laced with mines. The bunk hidden hundreds of hidden bunkers 
with uh, there you go with uh, and that you can see but the way the germans had disguised those bunkers with pine boughs and down pine trees you could be three feet from a bunker a platoon or a uh, a patrol and suddenly a, a german 50 cal would open up and you'd all be dead and so the you know, the gi's walking into the Hercus hurricane and it had snowed for the entire month of november there had been sunshine one day and it either snowed or rained so it's either frozen where they have to dig their foxholes with with tnt they're using dynamite c4 they're using to dig their foxholes or else it is mud up to the uh the 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 fenders of jeeps and they're pushing their jeeps through the uh the few forest roads the germans had cut down trees to stop because the allies of course had a uh, the two allied uh superiority air uh, uh air uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm losing the word air support yeah. close air support and uh and artillery were negated in the hurricane forest because the weather for 30 straight days it was cloud cover so all the airports air uh takeoff and places we had liberated in Belgium were of no use to us because we couldn't get planes in the air and we couldn't get our tanks in there. So it was a slog. It was almost you know, hill 400, our last hill. Uh, the Germans called it Bergberg. And uh, because there had been, that means Castle Hill, there had been an old medieval schloss, German castle at the top of that hill. Now, Napoleon's artillery had taken out most of that. And what made me think of that is because we're almost back to the age of Napoleon in the Hurtgen Forest in 1944 with soldiers just slogging through this muck and this, you can barely see. And the Germans had perfected tree burst artillery, which means that, you, you know, you're used to seeing a, 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 a shell land and create a crater. They had perfected and they had, they had outlined it. They had spotters. They had years to spot. And they said, if we tree burst here, in other words, if our shells land at the top of this clump of trees, not only will it rain iron from the shells on the, on the Amis, that's what they call the Americans, the Amis, but it'll rain these lethal wooden shards. When the, I remember one ranger, he wrote, when he first got into the forest, he thought that he was, that all the dead GIs he was seeing, he thought they had been speared by medieval pikemen. There was so much wood sticking out of them. So I, I hope that sets up the, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was right. It's out of the imagination of the brothers mm -hmm. Grimm, you know, with more blood, a lot more blood. Yeah. So um, Hill 400 is the last hill of your book, which just to remind people uh, of that book, it's The Last Hill by Bob Drury and Tom Clavin and Bob Drury is here with us today. So what makes Hill 400 so important? And why is it that with all the people, um, divisions, etc., in the Hurtgen, that a couple of hundred or excuse me, a few hundred Rangers get the job of taking it? Well, first of all, it, it sits Hill 400 sits on the eastern edge of the forest, the woodland. And uh, from that 1300 foot height, German artillery spotters can see the entire, nearly the entire 70 square mile uh, hurricane forest. So there's spotters up there and, uh, and we think, oh, you know, they're throwing shells up. No, these, they had these state of the art, nice. I'm not sure how to say the word in German, G-E-N-I-S-S, -S, nice, I think. Sites that were uh, better than any sites, artillery sites we had, the allies had. They could see a man moving 12 miles away and they would throw mortar at him. One man. We're not talking patrol. We're not talking about a platoon. We're not talking about a company. So we're getting wiped out with this. So people said, we can't get through the Hurricane Forest. We might be able to avoid some of the some of the towns. Schmidt. Schmidt was a big town, a crossroads in the Hurricane Forest, which didn't fall till February of 1945. But we can't avoid, if we're going to get through the Hurricane Forest, penetrate into germany we have to take this last hill this hill 400 and so once again it was the speed the in and out the clandestine the the officers the allied officers used to this p 
pound ahead, pound ahead, pound ahead. It just didn't work in the Harkin. But the stealthiness of the Rangers, the uh, they had been trained. They had been trained to go around obstacles as opposed to going through obstacles. And I think that's why these uh, these 400 men, uh, or actually 400 men started out. 400 men did not walk out. 400 Rangers did not walk out of the Hurricane Forest, but 400 Rangers walked in. I think that's, I don't think, I know that's why they succeeded, where uh, portions of 50,000 GIs before them had not. So what what uh, what was the condition uh, of the Ranger Battalion when they went into the Hurricane? Because not only are they they given this, uh, uh, quite frankly, impossible mission, uh, but right at the last moment before they go into the attack on this hill, something significant happens to the battalion. So maybe you know, kind of set up what the condition of the unit is when they get there, and what happens to them right before the attack even begins. Well, first of all, they were angry. They were angry that when they were first sent deployed into the hurricane they were not deployed as an offensive force they had been trained to take the cliffs of Pointe Hawk on d-day they had been trained to take the Lochris battery they had been trained offense 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 we move forward and courtney hodges the general the first army general he was using them as a defensive force he was putting them in foxholes and saying don't let the germans overrun us they didn't like that. So finally, they get the word. We're going to send you. You're going to be we're going to send you. You're going to be the tip. You're going to be in charge of taking this hill. And the night before it happens or the day before it happens, Colonel Rudder is called back to Belgium. And uh, it's, it's only a six hour ride. And they're getting the word and like they're ready to go. Where's Rudder? Where's Rudder? Rudder finally comes back and he said, uh, I've just been handed a regiment. Which is a well, he, he was a, uh, he, he deserved this, you know, he was commanding a battalion, now he's commanding a regiment. But the Rangers who had fled and fought and cried, and blood, sweat and tears with this colonel, they're like, what? The night before, we're to take Hill 400, the last hill? You're not gonna be with us? And he said, I tried, I tried, I tried, I talked my best, but Eisenhower wants me back. He wants me back leading this regiment in the uh in, in belgium and as it turns out i don't want to give too much away but as it turns out it was a good thing he does because he played a role in the battle of the bolts mm. but that kind of was a body blow it was a body blow to the rangers but on the other hand rudder had taught them well all those okay you're getting you know, all those think for yourselves yes it was a body blow for an hour or so when rudder when rudder stood in the snowy rain in the middle of the road and shook every man's hand goodbye. But then again, he had trained them to think for themselves and to act for themselves. And so his officers stepped up and, uh, and the job was done. I mean, uh, oh, when we get towards the end of this interview, I, I was just going to say something right now, but we'll wait till we get towards the end of this interview. Ask me to kind of wrap it up and, and I'll wrap it up for you. Okay. <laughs> I'm not hearing you, Rick. Can you hear Rick. me? He does this once a show. Once a show. Once a there show. you go. Hey. You're the one who's knowledgeable about this battle. You've been there. I'm going to cede the floor to you here. Yeah. Uh, now, well, well done. So, all right. So, Bob, they, they've had this body blow. Um, without giving too, too much away, tell us a little bit about what they're doing to get on top of this hill and hold it after several division size units have tried and failed. What is what is their method? How are they getting up there to, to, to take that ground? All right, I'll show you. Uh, if you could put, out that, put up that uh, a small map again. Yeah, you, uh, you, I'll find it, yep. Oh, okay, all right, so. Talk amongst fight, yourselves. There you, go. there you go. So they fight their way through, they, they, are, they leave Colonel Rudder at Kleinhau. You see Kleinhau at the top there. Yeah. They fight their way through Brandenburg, which has already been taken, but there's still German presence there. And they make their way into Bergstein, which is just a hellhole. You remember the opening scene in Blade Runner? That's what Bergstein looks like, except for dead bodies all over the place. So the, the, um, the, the GIs are hunkered down in Bergstein. The Rangers 
fight through Bergstein because the Germans control the eastern end of the town and they get to the base of Hill 400. And uh, uh, I, I think you can see it there. So half the battalion, what's left of the battalion, 400 men, they spread out to the northwest and the southwest to A, prevent German counterattacks, which you see by the, the red arrows there, but also to provide covering fire for the uh, 130 rangers who are going to uh, who are going to attempt to, to take Hill 400. And I have to, I have to look at my map, my own map here, uh, and I got it. Okay, yeah. So the Germans control the western slope of Hill 400. They control the eastern slope of Hill 400, and see the Roar River there. There are German artillery battalions on either side to the north and the south of the Roar, which are just going to pound the hell out of any American force, any army force trying to take it. So uh, on the morning of December 6th, 1944, three months, we've been trying to take this damn hill. September, October, November. On the morning of December 6th, uh, Chris, was it you, Rick? I, I can't remember who mentioned Len Lamel. But it, it, it was Chris. It was Len Lamel who his quote was, some people say June 6, 1944 was the longest day of World War II. For me, December 6, 1944 was the longest day of World War II. So on that morning of December 6, 1944, uh, as about half of what's left of the Ranger Battalion uh, spreads out to provide covering fire, 130 men. Uh, line up to ascend this hill. They have to cross a field, an open field, where they can be seen. There's no cover. There it is. There's the open field. And uh, they climb the hill. The playground slide I described before, 45 degrees. It's a, That looks really nice, but at the time it was snowy and icy, and it was, uh, it, it was just hell as German riflemen and machine gunners were pouring bullets down the western slope uh, uh potato mashers are rolling down it was it was hell grunahella reno uh of those 130 men 100 make it to the top hand-to-hand -hand fighting by this point neither the germans nor the americans have had a time to reload they've emptied their weapons they're fighting with uh trench knives they're fighting with they're killing each other with their helmets they're fighting with their entrenching tools. The, the Americans managed to scratch out a small perimeter around, uh, around the bunker that the German artillery spotters were using. And they're piling their dead into one half of the bunker. It's a morgue. They're piling their wounded into the other half of the bunker. It's an aid station. And they survive through that day and night. They survive uh, four or five counterattacks. And in between, I showed you before, from north and south, the Germans are just bombarding the hill with artillery. I mean, they knew what this meant. They knew if the Americans break through here, the Battle of the Bulge or the counterattack was in danger. And in fact, uh, it was Himmler, head of the SS. He had promised any unit that can retake Hill 400. First of all, he was shocked that we lost that they lost Hill 400. He said, any unit that retakes Hill 400, every man in that unit gets an Iron Cross first class. So the Germans were just clawing back trying to take this hill. And as they are doing it, the American perimeter is shrinking and shrinking. And their numbers are going down. They held it for the day all night. The next morning, they're down. The 100 men who made it to the top is, has been halved. They're down to 50 men, uh, 50 effectives. They are wounded. Uh, by noon, they're down to 30-something. Early in the afternoon, Len Lamel, Sergeant Len Lamel from Normandy Beach, who has been now field promoted to Lieutenant Len Lamel, he is, uh, he's the last officer standing atop Hill 400. His, uh, several of his fingers, his pinky, his thumb, they're hanging by their ligaments from bomb fragments. He's, uh, he's bleeding from his ears, from his nose. He's bleeding out of his anus, but he didn't let anybody know uh, from concussion, bomb concussions. He calls, he, he does a head count, 
and he counts uh, 20, and they've not been reinforced, the Rangers, and he counts 22 Rangers still standing. And these included several men who had crawled, wounded men who had crawled out of the aid station and uh, decided if I'm going to die, I'm going to die on the line. And Lamel got, and now the perimeter is just tiny. It's a tiny little perimeter around that, that bunker that the Germans had used as spotters and the Americans had to turn it into an aid station. And uh, he calls the four non-coms who are still standing, a staff sergeant, a platoon sergeant, uh, uh, and two regular sergeants. And Lamel says to them, I, I know, uh, I'm well aware that the United States Army is not a democracy. But in this one case, I'm going to make an exception. Uh, all our officers are either in that aid station or dead. I'm the last one standing, and it's my order that we take a vote to uh, retreat off this hill. We go back down the east slope, gather the rest of our Ranger Battalion, and we retake this hill, perhaps. The Germans are not the Japanese. They won't, they won't kill our wounded, our dead are dead. We will bury them with honors when we get back up here. Or you can look down there and then they could all see on the east, on the, on the bottom of the base of the east base of the hill, the German uh, infantry were not only uh, reforming to counterattack one, uh, one last, six, six time, but they had been reinforced by the, uh, and I'm not sure how to say the word, my German, Balschimjager. These elite, yeah. Jaeger, these elite German paratroopers had joined them. And Lamel said, this is what we're up against. So we're going to take a vote, and I'm going to stand by that vote. And he went around, and he said, Sergeant, 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 Sergeant. And Lamel voted himself. Now, vote was, Well, if you want to know what that vote was, you're going to have to read the damn read book. Read the book. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, right. Well played, Bob. Well played. Right. So um, that's uh, my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. <laughs> no. So it's it's obviously an amazing uh, amazing story, and and with many um, many people whose actions are are quite extraordinary. It's a, it's sort of one person, uh, uh, just to to. Um, uh, to pick one person out who 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 isn't even a ranger, uh, who plays a a, a great role. Oh uh, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. There's a guy named Howard Kettlehut, and yeah. uh, tell us just a little. We have we're getting towards the end, and we want to ask you a, a wrap up question after this. But tell us a little bit about Howard Kettlehut. Howard Kettlehut had been assigned to the Rangers. Look at him with the thin nose. I mean, and the Rangers were like, and he was a uh, artillery coordinator. And they had, oh, what's the number? You probably know it better than I do. Uh, there were 21 allied artillery uh, emplacements, everything from howitzers to mortars, who were going to support this ranger. And Howard Kettlehut went right in, knew not a single ranger. At first, they looked at him, and that picture doesn't, that photo doesn't really show up. It was a skinny little guy. And they're like, what's this guy doing? Howard Kettlehut turned out. He was the maestro of landing artillery. He could land or he could call in artillery so it would chase German troops into ranger ambushes. And afterwards, they said he was the best non-ranger we ever worked with. I mean, we could go on all night here. I mean, there's some one of my favorite characters, you know, Herman Bubby, Bubby Stein, a New Yorker, a New Yorker in the Rangers. In fact, he proved so there he is. There he is. He proved so adept at climbing that some of the rangers, when they were uh, still back in Tennessee, they wondered if this guy had been a second story man for the Jewish mafia back in New York. I mean, he scampered up Pont de Hoc on Normandy, and he got he got almost all the way up when his Mae West life preserver uh, inflated. He almost got knocked back down. And then 40 years later, at a uh, commemorative ceremony, the French government had invited any uh, some rangers over. He's in his mid-60s. He does it again. He does it again. I mean, we know we talked about Len Lamel. We talked about Bob. There's so many. Harold the Duke Slater, the uh, commanding officer of Fox Company. I mean, the Duke, even his name swagger. He had been blown off uh, uh, his LST, his landing craft, uh, 300 yards, maybe half a mile off the Normandy Beach. And the water was freezing that day. And about a week later, they're all going through the barracks bags. of uh, they, They've broken through to Normandy. The Rangers have bivouacked. Uh, in, in France, a few miles. 
the, the ritual is you go through the barracks back and you refold everything and you send it all back to the, these are the dead rangers belongings you send it back to mom and dad maybe a wife back in the states but first you check you make sure there's no pinup girls you make sure there's no condoms you make sure there's no deck of cards with risque pictures and in the duke's barracks bag they found a uh, uh an unopened bottle of white horse scotch so of course they opened it and they passed it around fox company and every took everybody took a swig and you know this is for the duke 12 days later, when the Duke shows up after having been floating in the uh, in in the frigid English Channel for 12 hours, he's treated for hypothermia. He shows up 12 days later and he's like, hey, where's my scotch? People are like, well, I got a patrol I got to run to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to do this. Sorry. I mean, there's so many characters. We go on all night. I'll tell you, one of my favorite, L. Rod Petty. L. Rod Petty is uh, he's a good old boy from the piney woods, the red dirt, uh, southern Georgia. And there he is. Now, look, look at his face. Now, see his face? You can't tell there, but you can kind of tell by his pinched cheeks. L. Rod Perry, he had, he had been a fighter. He had been a football player. He had no front teeth, top or bottom. The Army, of course, had issued him dentures, but he just said, they, they're uncomfortable. I don't like them. Uh, I can't wear them. And Rudder, who had a thing, he was kind of a stickler for the cut of a man's jib, that kind of thing. And Rudder would go to uh, Elrod Petty's uh, 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 company officers, platoon officers, and says, I, want, I want to transfer this guy out. You know, he, he just doesn't look like a squared away ranger to me with that, with no teeth and no sunken. It just doesn't fit the, my image of a ranger. And every officer would say, he's our best. And Elrod Petty would go on to become the heart and soul of Fox Company. But they say, he's our best, he is our best VAR man, Browning Automatic Rifle. He 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 belongs here, Colonel Rudder, he belongs here. But finally Rudder, one day he just said, he'd seen Patty and he said, son, come into my office, I have to talk to you. And he said, I, I know you uh, have been trying hard, but I'm gonna transfer you back to your, your old outfit. And Patty said to him, sir, Colonel Rudder, may I make my case? And Rudder went, sure. And Elrod Petty saying, I grew up in a broken home. Uh, my father beat me. The Rangers have become my family. I love the Rangers. I want to fight for the Rangers. I want to be a Ranger. And I think it was this last sentence that changed Rudder's mind because he looked at me and said, plus, in the end, Colonel Rudder, he went, showed his gums. He goes, I ain't planning on biting no Nazis to death. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we could go on. We could talk about these guys all night, you know. But, but we so. just have a moment or two left. But Chris, go ahead, give us a. I was last gonna say no, here. no. We're gonna, we're gonna. Uh, my last question was gonna be, what is, what is the, the legacy uh, of this battle um, to, to the war and to the Rangers? And hopefully, that's a broad enough question that you can wrap this up. Rangers lead the way. Rangers lead the way. Even that was, that was a Normandy Beach, uh, Normandy Beach thing, but uh, it's funny. Chris, I don't think there is a legacy mm -hmm. because this battle of the Hurtkin Forest was so washed over, as we said in the very beginning, historians, writers, uh, popular uh, military history writers like Tom and I or Hampton Sides or S.C. Gwent, you know, everybody want, anybody who writes around about World War II wanted to jump from D-Day to the Battle of the Bulge. Now, maybe a little in between, you know, the liberation of Paris, but it was all pursuit warfare. That's the official U.S. Army term for it as we chased the Germans across back east across Europe. And I think the legacy, if there is one, would be that Rangers and special operators in general, this was the beginning of the wars we fight today. I mentioned when we were off air that I had been a war correspondent for 20 years, Afghanistan and Iraq, Sarajevo, Darfur. I mean, hell holes all over the world. We fight our wars now with special operators. Yeah. And the Rangers, if in fact that second Ranger battalion, and of course it's remembered inside the U.S. military, that might have been the spur. I, I'm speculating here, but that might have been the spur for the way we fight today 
with SEALs and Marine Recon and, of course, Rangers and uh, pararescue jumpers in the Air Force, uh, combat control uh, operators in the Air Force. That might have led from in a, a very crooked road, crooked road, but that might have led from fall of 1944 to 2022 in our Army today and, and our armed forces today, I should say. Yeah. Bob Drury, thank you so much for joining thank us today. You, Just a tremendous conversation. I heard saw a lot of positive comments from people uh, in our in our comments pane. A reminder to everyone that the book by Bob Drury and Tom Clavin is The Last Hill, the epic story of a Ranger Battalion and the battle that defined World War II. And so, uh, Bob, I don't know what your next book is, but you know, give us a call when you got one. We'd love to have you back on. I'm working on it already, but uh, I'll, I'll keep it under. Once keep again, it under wraps. Keep it under yeah, wraps. But... You never know. I'm going to have a beer with somebody who's going to give me a better one. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Take Thanks, care. Bob. Oh, okay. Sorry. I cut, cut you off there, Bob. Didn't mean oh, I said, to... gentlemen, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, it, it was, it was kind of fun. I hope I was. I hope it was kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Thanks. Bye -bye. Uh, a little quick on the trigger there, Chris. Yeah, uh, well, you know, you know. Uh, very, uh, very fascinating uh, interview there. And uh, we have a, we're going to take a turn next week. We have a, a different topic, Chris. Uh, do, do you remember what it is? Do you want to? We are it? talking about uh, the battle of the battle of Dien Bien Phu and uh, sort of the start of, of the quagmire that became uh, the Vietnam yeah. War. But we'll be looking at it through the lens of the French uh, and uh, their effort to hold to hold their colony. And it's it's a really it's a new and in depth look. Uh, at this battle, and it's, it's been very well received, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, honestly. so that's a, a, a kind of a, a, a deep topic for next week. Lots of reading to do between now and then. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today and just remind you that all our programs are archived on YouTube and that you can listen to episodes I know, on, on the History Happy Hour podcast stream. It'll, it'll be up, it'll, it'll drop. It'll drop by tomorrow. Is that what they say? Is that what cool podcasters say? That, that's dropping? what we say. Us, oh, okay. you and I, cool podcaster oh, cool, people cool, cool like us say. People, yes. um, and right. It's available on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, and Pocket Cast. So, okay. Uh, if somebody else has another one, we'll try to make it available there. But um, gosh darn it, I think we're on most of them. Wow. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Be safe, everyone. Thank you.